exchange session. The first part of the party was for an key exchange by Kian and Nikon, who he has been on the front of the in the race of the Yakuba, so he has been. Iris scans belonging to all of his authorized users. And when Alice wants to access the resource, she takes a fresh scan of her iris and tries to use that to authenticate. Uh, so her fresh scan is going to be similar to, but not an exact match for, uh, the iris scan that Bob has stored. Uh, so they're, they're going to need to do something tricky. Uh, another application is authentication based on physical proximity. So here, the passwords would be something like noisy uh, and low entropy environmental readings. Uh, and this would be probably useful in the very near future when self-driving cars are everywhere and they want to help one another navigate their surroundings by sharing information about what they see. So in a situation like this, it would be uh, pretty important for these cars to prove to one another that they're actually nearby to uh, prevent some remote attacker from feeding them all false information. So authentication based on shared imperfect secrets or passwords is a very active area of research. And we can sort of categorize this work based on what password problems it deals with. So first, does it deal with passwords that are low entropy? And when I say that a password has low entropy, uh, I mean that it, it's possible to hit on the correct password uh, realistically by brute force enumeration. So maybe a 30-bit string I would consider to have low entropy. The second question is, uh, does this work deal with passwords that don't match exactly and might have some noise? So we can see the related work as partially filling in this table. The nicest cell in this table is the high entropy exact match cell. And in that cell, we have privacy amplification. So we still need something, because even though the passwords are high entropy and exact, you can't, they might not be uniformly distributed. Uh, so these privacy amplification protocols are very efficient, but they pay for this efficiency by having some leakage about the password used. And in the high entropy situation, that's totally fine, because there's so many bits of entropy that throwing out a few is totally, totally okay. Uh, but because we have some leakage, we can't directly apply these techniques to the low entropy setting. So in the low entropy scenario, we have a different set of protocols called password authenticated key exchange, or PIC. Um, 
And in these protocols, uh, it's, it's very important that there be no leakage at all about the passwords. So in particular, they even prevent offline dictionary attacks by um, an active participant or a man in the middle. So anyone who doesn't know the password but sees a transcript of, of a uh, execution that they either participated in or just observed, um, they shouldn't be able to then use that transcript to test their password guesses. So moving to the fuzzy match setting, in the high entropy scenario, we have information reconciliation and robust fuzzy extractors. Uh, but these also have some leakage, just like their exact match counterparts. And for the same reason, they don't translate into the low entropy world. And in fact, the only thing we have in the literature for the low entropy fuzzy match setting is just generic two-party computation uh, in the unauthenticated channels model. Uh, so so this, is, um, this is something we can use really anywhere in this table. And it tends to be pretty inefficient because it's so generic. So in our paper, we focus on this cell in the table for the first time. Uh, we introduce a new primitive, which we call fuzzy password authenticated key exchange, or fuzzy pick. And um, we define a fuzzy pick, and we give two efficient constructions of this thing. So next, I want to talk a little bit more about our security definition of fuzzy pick. So, like I told you before, um, if Alice and Bob share two passwords that are actually close, they want to be able to talk to one another, and as a result of this conversation, <coughs> they want to both hold the same high entropy uh, session key K. And any active or passive man in the middle should learn nothing at all about the passwords or the key, as long as that man in the middle doesn't already know some password that's close enough. Uh, if the two of them don't have passwords that are similar, so maybe Alice's password is curiouser and Bob's is, uh, can we fix it? Um, in this situation, they shouldn't end up agreeing on a secret key, and uh, neither of them should learn anything at all about the other's password. And this should be the case even if one of them is malicious and doesn't follow the protocol. So there are a few complications in uh, defining a fuzzy pink. And the first of these is that, well, for any key agreement protocol, it's very important that the protocol be composable. Key agreement is never the ultimate goal. Whenever you want to agree on a key, you probably want to then use that key in a different protocol. So, so you want to make sure that the protocol remains secure, even if other things are also being executed. The second difficulty is that just like PAKE, we really need to be secure against offline dictionary attacks. We're dealing with low entropy passwords, so we want to make sure that malicious participants and men in the middle, even if they've like saved a transcript, they can't then use that to test their guesses. So the approach we take is we generalize the universally composable functionality for PAKE given by Kennedy, Halevi, uh, Katz, Lindell, and McKenzie. And um, I'm not going to tell you anything more about this definition. It's a, the full definition is in the paper. So next, I want to tell you about our two constructions. So the first of these uses uh, regular non-fuzzy pick uh, together with something called robust secret sharing. And the second uses Yao's garbled circuits. And some of you might find this pretty alarming because I said earlier that I really wanted to avoid using generic two-party computation because it's inefficient. And here I'm saying that I'm going to use like one of the most famous generic two-party computation schemes. But we actually don't use it uh, in, the, in the straightforward way. We do something special specifically for fuzzy pink uh, that is actually pretty fast. So these two constructions, even though both of them realize fuzzy pink, differ in a few ways. The first of these is what notions of similarity between passwords they support. So until now, I've just been saying similar for, for some notion of similarity. And the Yao Scarpel circuit construction actually supports any efficiently computable notion of similarity. Uh, but the PAKE and robust secret sharing construction is uh, limited to Hamming distance. 
the Yao scaffold circuit construction pays for its generality uh, with lower efficiency, so both in terms of number of rounds and uh, computation. It's more expensive. So I want to start by talking about the less general but more efficient construction. And because we're talking about Hamming dis distance, uh, I'm going to assume that our two passwords are of the same length. So this construction follows a very natural template. Our two parties, Alice and Bob, they do share a secret. It's a problematic secret, but a secret nonetheless. So we're going to have one of them, without loss of generality, let's say Alice, pick the key she wants to agree on with Bob and encrypt it to Bob using their shared uh, secret as the encryption key, so using the password as an encryption key. And this is going to have to be some very special form of encryption because this, this encryption is going to have to tolerate error in the encryption and decryption keys. It's going to have to work even if the encryption key and the decryption key are a little bit different. But even assuming that we have this magical encryption, um, we have the problem that the encryption key, the password, is low entropy. And any eavesdropper who sees this ciphertext is going to be able to really narrow down uh, the options for this session key just by trying, um, just by going through the password space and trying to decrypt. So we address this by turning every single character of the password into a high entropy key. We're going to expand the entropy of, of every password character. And Alice and Bob are going to do this using PIC. So PIC is a tool that takes in low entropy objects that match or don't match and gives the parties high entropy objects that also match or don't match based on whether the low entropy objects did. Alice and Bob are going to run PIC for every single character in their password. And whenever the, pass uh, the password characters match, they're going to get back the same key. And whenever they don't, they're going to get back different keys. Uh, and at the end, they're going to have this list of what we're going to call character keys, high entropy character keys that match or don't match, depending on whether the corresponding characters did. So one crucial observation here is that it's very important for neither Alice or Bob to learn whether they agree on any given character. So imagine that Alice's password is what I have here, but Bob's password is, we can fix it. So if Alice learns whether she agrees with Bob on any given character, despite the fact that she doesn't know a password close to Bob's, she's going to learn that you know, his first character isn't P. And for low entropy passwords, this is, this is a lot of leakage. This is not acceptable. So we uh, introduce a UC definition for a new flavor of PIC, which we call implicit only. Uh, and this new flavor of PIC specifically has this uh, property that neither party learns whether they succeeded in agreeing on a key. So they don't have key confirmation. And one of the uh, famous PIC protocols, EKE2, actually has this property this implicit only property. And that's the PIC protocol that we use. All right, so now when Alice does this magic encryption step, instead of using her password as the encryption key, she's going to use her list of character keys. Uh, and Bob is going to use his list of character keys to decrypt. So this magical encryption, uh, really quickly, it works uh, through a combination of robust secret sharing of the message of the secret key K, uh, together with a one-time pad encryption of the secret sharing using the character keys as a pad. Uh, and this is very similar to the code offset construction of Jules and Wattenberg. So I'm not going to give you any more details about this. I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, next, I want to talk about our Yao's garbled circuit construction. So like I said earlier, this one is more general, but less efficient. So um, one of the tracks yesterday heard a lot about Yao's garbled circuits already. So I'm not going to spend too long um, introducing them. I'm going to be minimalistic here. So Yao's garbled circuits are a two-party computation scheme where the two parties play different roles. One of them is going to be a garbler, and one of them is going to be the evaluator. So the garbler takes the function that they want to compute and garbles it. 
and she's, she then sends this garbled function or garbled circuit to the evaluator. And the evaluator is able to evaluate this, this garbled circuit and learn the function output. And there are a lot of steps here I'm skipping, but really high level, this is how it is. Uh, so the way we can use something like this for fuzzy fake is just have one of our parties garble a closeness circuit. So the circuit is gonna take in the two passwords as input, compare them, and if they're similar enough, it's gonna output you know, Alice's chosen session key, and if the two passwords are too different, it's maybe not gonna output anything. Uh, and then Bob is gonna evaluate this. The problem with doing something like this is that Yao's garbled circuits offer asymmetric security guarantees. So they're secure no matter what the evaluator does. The evaluator can be malicious and still won't be able to learn anything at all about Alice's input apart from the like, actual computation output. But Alice, the garbler, has to be semi-honest. If she chooses to instead be malicious, there is a lot she can do to screw things up. She could, for instance, just garble a totally different circuit. She could garble a circuit that always returns the same key, uh, thus fooling Bob into agreeing with her, like no matter what his password was. So, um, like I just said, Yao's garble circuits don't guarantee correctness against a malicious garbler. And they actually also don't guarantee privacy against a malicious garbler. Uh, because if Alice garbled something along the lines of a circuit that just returns maybe a few bits of Bob's password, once she learns the function output, she's gonna learn information about Bob's input that she shouldn't have learned. The upside is that Yao's garbled circuits are actually really fast as two-party computation goes. There are a lot of transformations out there that guarantee uh, correctness and privacy in Yao's garbled circuits against either party being malicious. But the downside of all of these is that if you consider pre-processing a part of the computation, the overhead is going to be pretty high. There's like a lot of cool works here that I didn't list uh, over the recent years. There is one more transformation, which is called dual execution which has a very small overhead, so it's only twice as expensive as regular Yao's garbled circuits. But the downside of dual execution is that it gives one bit of leakage to the adversary. And especially in our setting, when we're dealing with passwords that have very low entropy, one bit of leakage can be crucial. We don't want that. So we uh, modify dual execution to eliminate this leakage when it matters, specifically for fuzzy pink. So, all right, let's have Alice garble this closeness circuit like we did before. And instead of outputting, yes, the passwords are close, or no, they're not close, this circuit is going to output a yes or no key. So it's gonna output the yes key if the two passwords are close and the no key if they aren't. So she sends the circuit over to Bob, Bob is going to evaluate it and learn uh, one, of the, one of the two keys. And um, because this isn't secure against a malicious garbler, against a malicious Alice, we're going to do this whole thing again in the other direction also. So now Bob gets to play the role of the garbler, Alice has to play the role of the evaluator, and as the evaluator, she can't cheat. So what Alice is gonna do, once we do both of these steps, is she's gonna take her own yes key, she's gonna take the one key that she learned from Bob's circuit, she's gonna XOR them, and the result is gonna be her session key. And Bob is gonna do the exact same thing on his side. So if both parties were honest, and if both circuits decided that, you know, yes, the passwords are close, they are close in this picture, uh, then clearly these two are gonna actually agree on a key. They're gonna be XORing the same key, so or the same two, the same pairs of keys. If um, if the passwords are actually far, then Alice is gonna be using her own yes key, but Bob's no key, and Bob is gonna be using his own yes key, but Alice's no key. So they're gonna be XORing two totally different, independent pairs of keys, and they're gonna end up with different session keys. Now let's say Alice is trying to fool Bob into agreeing with her. Well, as the garbler, she can cheat. She can make Bob uh, you know, get the 
get her, her yes key out of her circuit, even if his password is far away from hers. Uh, but since she can't cheat as the evaluator, there's really nothing she can do to learn anything about Bob's yes key, this blue key over here. So there's nothing a malicious Alice can do to agree with Bob when their passwords are actually far. So we can view what we just did as a variation of uh, dual execution in the general case. So dual execution has very symmetric guarantees. No matter what the correct computation output is, dual execution guarantees that you know, both parties will either get the correct answer or know that cheating took place, uh, and it lets an adversary get one bit of leakage. We make a trade. We say that, okay, well when the computation output is yes, when the correct output is yes, we're gonna let the adversary still have their one bit of leakage, and we're also gonna you know, give up on correctness. We're not gonna have any correctness guarantees. But in exchange, we want uh, better things in the case that the correct computation output is no. So not only do we want a correctness guarantee, we also want to eliminate the one bit of leakage. So this actually turns out to be the perfect trade-off for fuzzy pick, because in, in fuzzy pick, intuitively, we only care about security against an adversary that doesn't already know the password. And if the adversary doesn't already know the password, then we're in the no case. So in the no case, we're guaranteeing that the adversary can't learn anything about the password and can't fool our parties into agreeing on a key. Uh, but in the yes case, when um, the adversary already knows a password that's close enough, um, the adversary can fool the other party into not agreeing with them, which they can really do anyway just by using a random thing as, as their password. Um, and they get to learn one additional bit of leakage, which is also arguably okay, because they already have all the information they need in order to agree on a key. All right, so in conclusion, uh, there's been a lot of work on uh, key exchange based on imperfect secrets. We're the first to look at the low entropy fuzzy match setting and we give UC uh, security definitions for this new primitive called fuzzy peak and two different constructions which are on, on different points on the sort of efficiency generality curve so are probably useful in uh, slightly different scenarios. All right, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>